Director of Environmental Law Center. <clears throat> and that's uh, part of the reason I get the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, um, David Wirth. And, uh, but uh, first, a few quick uh, notes for people. You may all know this, but this is part of the Vermont Law School Hot Topics um, lecture series, which we do each summer. And it's a great opportunity for folks to uh, both learn from really some you know, impressive, distinguished scholars um, that come through and thinkers and doers. Um, it's also a way to get CLE credit for those of you who are licensed in Vermont. Um, as I am, um, and if you uh, if you want to get your credit, don't forget there's a sign-in sheet over by Carl Yurker. Carl, will you wave? Um, so you can uh, sign in there, and we'll we'll keep a record of it. Um, feel free to eat uh, loudly or or not. It's up to you. <laughs> and um, we'll have some question and answer after David's presentation. So, but, but let me introduce David. Um, professor Worth is a is a professor of law at Boston College. Um, he's got a long, distinguished career in, um, as an academic and as a practitioner. He's worked at the Natural Resources Defense Council on international issues, where he was a senior attorney there. He's also um, spent time um, in the uh, U.S. State Department working on international issues in the o area of oceans. And he's, um, unlike me, his, his CV is full of publications. <laughs> um, and also, unlike me, his publications are are deeply thoughtful and substantive. Um, and uh, if you get a chance, Google or go on Google Scholar and, and pull up some of his, um, his writings, which um, when I want to talk, for instance, about what's going on in Paris, I will, I will Google David's um, articles because I know I'll get the most relevant, up-to-date, and thoughtful information out there, with the possible exception of that produced by Professor Tracy Bach. <laughs> um, and uh, in terms of his, his pedigree, he, uh, he has managed to transcend his, his second-rate um, education, which involves tours at, at Yale, Princeton, and Harvard, and includes uh, the law degree from Yale, as well as uh, degrees in chemistry from um, Harvard and Princeton. So um, this is your 26th summer, um, according to my records, <laughs> of teaching here at Vermont Law School. And it is with great pleasure I invite you to, to present to us on Trump and the Paris Agreement, the <clears throat> inside story. Thank you very much, David, for that very kind introduction. Um, as David said, I've been coming here for uh, longer than certainly any of my children can remember. They uh, have all been coming to Vermont ever since they were uh, they were little tykes, and it's been an important part of our, uh, of our family. The, um, I'm probably not the first to note that the title Hot Topics is particularly appropriate when you're talking about climate. Um, and I seem to remember that I was standing here in this very spot just three years ago talking about the Obama administration's approach to negotiating the Paris Agreement. Uh, now. The situation has changed somewhat significantly, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk again about where we are with Paris at the moment. Um, just as a bit of background, um, I happened to be this past year in Moscow for a year as a Fulbright Fellow at the Higher School of Economics. The, when I learned that uh, Trump was about to go on the television, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, US time, 10 o'clock Moscow time. And I wanted to be ready to get something out right away. It turned out that my son, who's now 27, he was first two when he came to, uh, to Vermont, was visiting. And I had to stay up until 2 o'clock to crank out uh, an op-ed. He got tired and went to sleep because he had been required to go through the registration process not once but twice because of the football competitions that were going on in Moscow. So it was, the whole experience was rather surreal for both of us. So I'm now, uh, I now feel fortunate to be able to share that surreal experience with you. Um, I consider it, just as another point of background, um, I consider it both an honor and a pleasure to be a teacher. And the way I've structured this presentation is to um, give you, uh, first of all, to give you some background. This is the view out of my Moscow apartment, by the way, the best in Moscow. Um, the, the fireworks come from Red Square, which is in the background. Um, so after prolonged public discussion, <laughs> maybe appropriate for this topic, 
uh, after prolonged public discussion, uh, Trump disrupts the G7 outcome and then announces the intent on the part of the United States to withdraw on June 1st. I consider it a, an honor and a privilege to be a teacher, and what I'd like to do in this presentation is to, first of all, to give you some background on the Paris Agreement and how it came to be. There's actually a lot of misinformation in this country about the Kyoto Protocol and some of the precursors to Paris. So it's helpful, uh, at least in my opinion, to have a just objective statement of how the Paris Agreement came to be. Then the second portion is what's in it, and then the third part are, is the implications of withdrawal. By the way, all of this, maybe I shouldn't say this uh, given David's very kind introduction, but all of this is public international law 101. Uh, all of this can be deduced from first principles of international law, and I'm going to try to refrain from embellishing with my personal comments until the, until the questions, just to tell you what the situation is and uh, in a neutral way what it means. So, um, in fact, this presentation is entirely up to date. This is the uh, G20 communique from just this Saturday. And let me decode this a little bit for you. Um, the communique consists of any number of pages, including this entry on improving sustainable livelihoods, energy, and climate. Um, I was actually quite surprised to see the structure of this, uh, of this communique based on the previous G7 communique. Um, this is, as my students are about to, dis to discover when they engage in a simulated uh, um, international multilateral negotiation, this is exactly where you don't want to be in a multilateral setting. That is to have a paragraph devoted just to you. As my uh, Russian teacher one time said, at least in Russian, you never want to be special. Uh, also in multilateral negotiations, you never want to be special. And so decoding this statement structurally, um, the other 19 leaders, by the way, not all of whom are so enthusiastic about the Paris Agreement, uh, the other 19 leaders basically said, OK, US, we'll give you your paragraph. You can put whatever you want in it. And on the other hand, we're not about to endorse it. We're not going to have anything else to do with that. Um, and then we, the leaders of the other G20 members, which is very embarrassing, uh, state the following. So unless you have some experience with multilateral negotiations, this kind of structural inference may be difficult to identify. Uh, but it, in fact, reflects progress in some sense on the G7 communique in which the positions were to some extent amalgamated. Here, the other 19 leaders are basically saying, OK, US, we're prepared to have you go it alone. OK, so I'd like to talk about the history of multilateral efforts going back to the 1992 convention, uh, then the Paris Agreement and its significance, and last, uh, withdrawal and its legal implications. The history of multilateral efforts starts with the creation of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 1990, which was designed to set the stage for uh, cooperative multilateral efforts on climate by creating basically a global risk assessment process involving scientists from every country on the planet, at least potentially. It was a joint and is a joint project of the, um, of the um, International Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program. In what turned out to be the speed of light <laughs> from multilateral terms, a, uh, a convention was adopted in 1992, the Framework Convention. Now, I know a lot of you know this information or think you know it, but please be patient as I explain where we are and how we got to where we are. This term framework um, is in fact, a term of art and is designed to create an architecture under which states are expected to cooperate in the future. So the 1992 convention didn't actually result in any reductions in emissions of greenhouse gases. Rather, it contains obligations like reporting, um, periodic meetings, which now occur, the, the famous conferences of the parties, which occur in late November or early December. It creates a framework for 
future cooperation. It also, um, it also created what I call the original sin of distinguishing between categories of parties, 33 parties which were identified as Annex I, basically developed countries and, uh, and countries in transition, that is the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union and its uh, constituent republics now independent states. As, and all of the rest um, were identified, uh, were separated out. The IPCC came out with its second assessment report, ramping up concern about the relationship between human activities and climate change, anthrop anthropogenically induced climate change. And then the first protocol came out in 1997. A protocol is a term of art. It's intended to uh, refer to an ancillary international agreement that requires separate adoption, signature, ratification, and entry into force. Uh, Kyoto Protocol came out in 1997. Um, the Kyoto Protocol created obligations for those 33 uh, Annex I parties. It was intended to reduce emissions from that subset of all the parties to the convention by about 5%. By reference to 1990 levels, um, by through the end of the first commitment period, which was 2008 to 2012. This is the way most multilateral environmental agreements are framed, a baseline, percentage reduction, and then a target. In this particular case, it was a window rather than a particular uh, date certain. And what the Kyoto Protocol did was to apportion out uh, responsibility for that overall 5% reduction uh, to each of the 33 Annex I parties. So the EU collectively had a reduction obligation of 8%, minus 8, so a reduction to 92% from the 1990 levels. The United States was assigned minus 7. Other countries such as Australia uh, did not have to make any reductions at all. The, um, the Kyoto Protocol um, had, a, had a trigger, an entry into force provision, specifying 55 states, 55 ratifications, uh, representing 55% of carbon dioxide emissions uh, in the year 1990. Those numbers were quite well known. Well, of the 100% of carbon dioxide emissions in the year 1990, 35% was accounted for by the United States. Um, if you think about it, um, that leaves only a 10% margin of error to meet the 55% for entry into force. So what that meant, basically, was that uh, every other major emitter, every one of those other uh, 33 parties in the Annex I list, had to say yes. I went to a meeting, I was actually representing uh, the government of Belgium in, the, in its capacity as the presidency of the EU in 2001, after George Bush said that he did not intend to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Um, one of the very few international meetings I've ever been at where the outcome was genuinely uncertain. Japan raised its flag, a concept known to my students who were about to begin negotiating tomorrow, raised its flag and announced that it intended to ratify, and there was spontaneous applause throughout the room. Um, so after, with a lot of work, the other parties were brought on, the Russian Federation being the last. It's fairly well known that the quid pro quo for Russia's ratification was um, a concession from the European Union that it would get to uh, join the membership of the World Trade Organization, which it did in 2012. The Russians are pretty good at, at linkage. <laughs> uh, so the Kyoto Protocol did enter into force. The United States signed it, Al Gore himself, but never ratified. Uh, one of the reasons was that the absence of domestic implementing legislation to implement its cap and trade system. So um, subsequently, implementing rules were adopted uh, in 2001, and the, the famous uh, flexible mechanisms were put in place. One is emissions trading, joint implementation, and the clean development mechanism. And the other, the remaining Annex I parties uh, were off to meet their targets under Kyoto. 
By the way, there's some interesting research that's been done that has, by Michael Grubb and others, that has not been very widely publicized, which demonstrates that every Kyoto party met its target without any question, that compliance with Kyoto has been 100%. Obviously, not for the United States, because the United States was never fully legally bound. If you think about it, the next step would be, uh, what do we do after Kyoto, after that first window, 2008 to 2012? Uh, negotiations were supposed to commence in 2005. They didn't actually get going until 2007. And they were divided into two pieces. Um, one was further commitments from Annex I parties. That sounds like Kyoto. The other was under the convention itself, uh, long-term cooperative action dealing with adaptation, which by this point had become a significant issue. Right. We, as you all probably know, we are committed to future climate change through banked emissions that are already in the system whose effect we have not yet felt. Particularly in, in, uh, in vulnerable developing countries such as Bangladesh, such as small island states uh, that may have relatively few resources to respond to the effects of climate change, there's a need for additional funding. So adaptation and funding have tended to go, to, go together in the climate negotiations, and they are done under the auspices of the convention itself, so that those discussions apply to all parties. 2009 COP15, the 15th conference of the parties, uh, was expected to be a breakthrough in terms of bringing these strands together into some new output. In, scholars differ as to the, as to the outcomes from COP15, uh, it wasn't entirely a waste, but it did not produce the expected new agreement or extension of the Kyoto Protocol. In fact, the, um, in fact, the parties were unable to agree even on a non-binding statement. If you go back to the, uh, to the quotation from the G20 summit, just hot off the presses from Saturday, uh, there is a statement that the other 19 states take note of the United States' intention to withdraw. Uh, I mean, this is very much tongue-in-cheek. Take note is a sarcastic way of saying we, we identify that this situation exists, but we don't necessarily agree with it. So there was a, the outcome from COP15 was uh, equivocal. One area of progress was that non-Annex I states such as uh, Brazil, India, China, uh, began to take on non-binding, nationally appropriate mitigation uh, actions. The, the um, mitigation is a code word in the climate negotiations for emissions reduction. So we had Kyoto entered into force with great controversy, uh, an attempt to move beyond it and to expand Kyoto to the global level looks to have been unsuccessful in 2009. Against that background, um, the parties started negotiating uh, again with the goal of, first of all, creating a solution that all states, not just the 33, uh, not just the 33 Annex I uh, parties and the one international organization, the European Union, could accept, um, uh, getting past what one scholar has called the debilitating divide that was set up in the Framework Convention. Second major, uh, second major goal was to bring the United States back. President Obama had, in fact, participated in the negotiation of the, of the Copenhagen outcome, uh, but unfortunately was uh, unsuccessful in breaking the impasse and getting to some sort of joint solution. So the idea was to take, for states to take their time uh, to come up with, um, with proposals that could be fully discussed, and also to do that out of the public eye. Kyoto had been very much criticized because of its top-down structure. Where did those numbers come from? Minus seven for the United States, minus eight for the European Union. Um, the answer is, as any negotiator will tell you, they were negotiated. No state is going to accept numbers like that without agreeing to them. But the, the perspective gained traction that somehow this was the international system trying to impose itself on states such as the United States. So in advance of, of COP21 in Paris in uh, December 2015, 
the goal was a protocol, another instrument. The word protocol having, a, having acquired a very negative connotation within the United States, particularly in the United States Senate. Uh, another instrument or an agreed outcome with legal force applicable to all states. So that just to deconstruct that, it means some legally binding instrument that applies to all states, not just Annex I states. Um, and the mechanism for doing that was um, to come was the Paris Agreement. So the legal setting, it was adopted in December 2015 at the 21st Conference of the Parties. It was signed on Earth Day the following year in New York. Um, it has 191 signatories, basically every state on the planet. Um, it entered into force after ratification by 55 states, again representing 55% of global emissions. Interestingly, the entering to force provision says approximately, because the expectation was that we wouldn't have difficulty getting to that 55%, which in fact turned out to be true. It was uh, adopted in December, signed in April, and entered into force. Um, the United States and China ratified simultaneously in September uh, of the following year at the G20 summit, just about a year ago. And the agreement entered into force really at the speed of light on November 14, um, 2016, uh, a mere four days before the U.S. presidential election in which um, the, can the winning candidate had run on a platform um, stating that he intended to cancel the Paris Agreement. No reservations are allowed, um, which is important. All states accept the same obligations. The goals of the Paris Agreement are, um, this is probably familiar to you, to limit warming to below two degrees Celsius, um, and ideally to limit it to uh, no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius. The 1.5 uh, target, I think almost everybody agrees, all the scientists, that um, it's, uh, that's out of the question at this particular point. If you take all the emission reduction commitments and reverse engineer, uh, we'll be lucky to limit warming to 2 degrees and 1.5 we're probably already bought into. Um, respond to adverse effects of uh, bank climate change, that's adaptation, and to provide finance. These, it's obviously more complicated than this, but these are the three main pillars or legs of Paris. Uh, mitigation, that is emissions reductions, adaptation, and finance. Um, the mechanism for doing that, instead of the, the supposed Kyoto top-down approach, was for was what has been described as a bottom-up approach in which states identify their own nationally determined contributions. Note, by the way, this is not a commitment. Commitment implies legal obligation contributions, so they are voluntarily identified, and you can see them all. Now there are 147 of them. They are public, which is an important component of the Paris Agreement. Um, just to take a look at some of them, the, um, the European Union has, a, uh, has committed to a reduction uh, by 40% by the year 2030 by comparison with 1990. This is a classic Kyoto formulation. The base year is 1990, the, uh, a percentage reduction, and a target year. Here's the US contribution that I talked about three years ago in this, in this very spot. Uh, 26 to 28% reduction, so that looks like Kyoto, from an Annex I state, the United States, uh, representing re-engagement by the US only through 2025. Um, of the NDCs that were submitted, most of them went through 2030. There's a, um, and the baseline is a different year, 2005. So this reflects the principle of differentiation. Nobody's telling the United States it has to fit into this mold. This is what it can do. Um, and this, so this was proposed by the uh, Obama administration, by the way, is still in force as of this day. The United States has not yet filed a formal notice of withdrawal. Um, in fact, there have been 50 notifications to the depository since Trump's speech, and not one of them has come from the United States. So at least as of this, as of this moment, 
Um, it's just a speech. It's just a proposal. Um, obviously a big one, but um, the U.S. has not taken action. Um, the reason that the U.S. NDC was phrased this way was that um, the United States had been unsuccessful in adopting cap-and-trade legislation that would have implemented Kyoto. That was Waxman and Markey in 2009. So instead, Obama cleverly, in my opinion, relied on existing authority, which is not uh, a, an economy-wide reduction approach, but in, instead a sectoral approach. So we have the Clean Air Act, the Clean Power Plan, uh, the, um, the uh, vehicle efficiency rules that were adopted by the Obama administration. You add them all up in reverse engineer, and you get a number that looks something like this. So this was thought to be pushing the edges of the envelope by the Obama administration uh, based on the authority that was already in place. Uh, Russia, which still has not ratified, one of the major, only major countries that has not, um, the, uh, a rather aggressive goal of 70 to 75 percent, again, notice 2030. When I gave this talk to, to Russian audiences, there was invariably laughter at this point because I, include the, I included the Russian version. And this term, this expression, might be, is in fact cleverly chosen in the Russian, uh, in the, the Russian NDC. Might be means could be, we, and you can see that the mode, uh, what a linguist would call the, the modal character of this need not necessarily be something that even looks binding, it might be. And also the word in Russian, the expression in, in Russian, also means perhaps, maybe. <laughs> so Russian audiences tended to, uh, in a, um, tended to chuckle at this particular point. China, one that's gotten a lot of attention. Um, China, remember, China is not an Annex One country, so it didn't have obligations under Kyoto. It agreed to peaking emissions of carbon dioxide by 2030. Remember, the EU and other states are agreeing to l reduce emissions, but for China, as a um, given its particular situation. This arguably makes some sense because in, other, in order for emissions to come down, they have to peak at some point. That's the reason that peaking in these negotiations has been so important. Uh, second of all, an obligation phrased not in absolute terms but in terms of carbon intensity, which is the uh, amount of carbon emitted per unit GDP. This has been a consistent theme with some developing countries. In other words, not an absolute reduction, but a reduction in the amount of carbon it takes to produce a particular unit of GDP. Also to increase the share of non-fossil fuels in, the, in primary energy consumption to around 20% and increase forest stock. These are all areas uh, that are of great concern to the international community. By the way, this was actually negotiated with China bilaterally by the United States, by the Obama administration, and released about a year in advance of Paris. Because of the competitiveness considerations, China and the United States are quite closely linked. Um, one of the points I wanted to make is that some other non-Annex One countries have been quite aggressive. Brazil, um, an absolute economy-wide reduction, 37% uh, by 2025. Um, which is presumably going to be a challenge for Brazil and um, a subsequent commitment to 2030. The, um, so the legal form is a, is a binding agreement that, that applies to all parties. The nationally determined contributions are not binding, and then there are a variety of non-binding um, uh, undertakings in the agreement itself, not commitments because they're not binding. So the, the, the Paris Agreement is most definitely a binding agreement. It's a treaty under international law. However, it contains many non-binding components. And I'll give you an example of how, why that made a difference in just a second. Um, the mitigation commitments are to achieve a peaking as early as possible. Remember, China promised to do so by 2030. Um, to achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions and sources and removals by the second half of this century. 
Translated into English, that means basically net zero carbon emissions. There might be, still be some emissions, but that they would be offset by sinks. One of the themes in this, in the, um, in the global climate negotiations has been that it turns out to be easier politically to identify targets that are further away. So that near-term targets, 20, uh, 2020, 2025, can be quite difficult. Um, but identifying further targets presumably is beyond the time range of any one politician's term in office. So uh, turn out to be politically somewhat easier. Uh, a global stock take in uh, 2023 and every five years after. The idea is the states will, the parties will, contribu will contribute new NDCs periodically that with a ratchet effect, that they're more and more aggressive over time. That's the basic mechanism of emissions reductions in the Paris Agreement. Uh, let me s skip to, um, oh yikes. Um, Adaptation, um, the, the form is uh, um, basically that every state will submit an adaptation plan um, that developing countries can seek support for that. And the support will come from, among other things, the Green Climate Fund um, as of the, as of the um, uh, most recent tally, there were, uh, con the goal was $100 billion per year, uh, total was $62 billion in 2014, 52 in 2013. The United States has, I'm sorry, this is difficult to read, but you want to focus on this figure. The United States under Obama committed $3 billion, and the Obama administration actually made a contribution of a billion towards the end of its term in office. OK, so withdrawal. The mechanism for withdrawal. Um, the, first of all, I wanted to, the principal uh, mechanism identifying the, uh, the obligation to submit successive nationally determined contributions, again, not commitments, is found in Article 4. Um, and this paragraph four turned out to be quite controversial in the actual negotiations. This word, um, the, um, the, because the United States was insisting on, um, the word shall originally appeared in the final draft prepared by the uh, prepared by the chair and was opposed by the United States, which held up the negotiations in the last minute. Why? The answer is that going back to the implementation mechanism in the United States, relying on existing sources, um, it wasn't clear that the United States could actually make a more aggressive contribution in the future if, all, if the only domestic mechanisms were the Clean Air Act and the ve vehicle fuel efficiency standards. So, so as to keep the international obligations consistent with the domestic capacity to deliver on them, the State Department lawyers insisted on challenging this provision in uh, and keeping it in a non-binding mode. I mean, I used, as David said when he introduced me, I used to do this job, and I can understand why that would have been a concern. Now, um, Trump comes into office and at least according to the popular press, was focusing on paragraph 11. Um, the, you may recall that the uh, Trump administration has, uh, has started the process of ratcheting back on the Clean Power Plan and a variety of other uh, environmental regulations. It, the question naturally comes up, what about the relationship with the US NDC? Can it be reduced? The expectation is that it will always be more aggressive and more robust can it be reduced consistently with the, uh, the legal obligations in the agreement? Uh, two of the principal negotiators, uh, both of whom I know personally, were quoted in the press as saying 
That's not exactly what was intended, but it is legal under the agreement that to reduce the, uh, the level of commitment in the US NDC would be consistent with the US's legal obligations uh, uh, under the Paris Agreement. Nonetheless, uh, Trump decided to withdraw. He gave a statement on uh, June 1st, as I said, uh, 3 o'clock um, uh, East Coast time, 10 o'clock Moscow time, um, and in the process made a number of statements that were really quite demonstrably false. Um, one of them was that China uh, will be able to build hundreds of additional coal plants, um, and we can't build any new coal plants, but they can according to the Paris Agreement. You already have the tools to judge the accuracy of this statement. These contributions are non-binding, number one. They are voluntary. You saw the two different contributions, China's and the US's, put up there. Neither of them says anything about coal plants, nor does the agreement itself. So that, uh, I mean, many of the statements in this speech, by the way, the title of which is even incorrect, it refers to the Paris Accord as opposed to the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, are simply demonstrably incorrect, such as this one, which was checked by PolitiFact. In any event, um, what happens once the United States um, withdraws? The, this is the text of the Paris Agreement, which says that uh, at any time after the agreement has been in force for three years, so that for the United States would be uh, from November 2016 plus three years is November 2019. Um, it may give a notice of its intent to withdraw. Why is this? The answer is that other states have relied upon the United States delivering on its commitments. Um, it's kind of like uh, I one time bought an insurance policy and then uh, paid premiums on it for, for a while and then decided that I didn't really want it. And so I asked, can I get the premiums back? And the answer was absolutely not, because you were indeed covered during that period. The, the idea is very similar here, which is that having entered into this agreement, and by the way, the United States never formally committed to Kyoto. It signed, but it did not, uh, it did not ratify. Here, this agreement is in force for the United States, so legally we're talking about an entirely different concept, which is withdrawal from an agreement that is already in place. Um, other states have relied on us, and um, uh, so that there should be the, the um, three-year waiting period. Then there's an additional one-year waiting period, which you can think of as a cooling off period. Even after the notice is given, uh, it, uh, a state can change its mind if its domestic political situation changes, if it has another election, which is in fact coming up almost to the day. Uh, of the earliest that the US withdrawal, withdrawal would become effective. Um, so that there are good reasons for international law to temper the effect on other parties and on, in this particular situation, the world as a whole, uh, of a, what you might describe as a rogue action by any one state. Um, <clears throat> the, Keep your eye on this one, paragraph three. Any party that withdraws from the convention shall also be considered as having withdrawn from, the, from this agreement. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, so why a waiting period? It's a quid pro quo for having become a party in the first place. Um, formal notice has not yet been given. Um, there's no particular benefit to early notification because as you saw just from reading the language yourself, uh, as I tell my students in every course uh, that I teach, and uh, I suppose that includes this lecture, one of the, one of the goals is to, is to get students, to get the audience to read operative language for themselves, for itself. You just saw it. There's no benefit to, early, to earlier notification. Presumably that's one reason why it has not yet been, uh, has not yet been given. Um, so this will inevitably be a live campaign issue for uh, for Democratic challengers and maybe Republican challengers as well. All they need to say is, one day after I get into office, I can reverse this action because it has not yet taken effect for the United States. 
By the way, Trump has said in his statement said that he intends to cease implementation of the uh, USNDC immediately and to withhold money. Um, neither of those are contrary to international law because remember the NDC was not, was not uh, binding in the first place and the monetary commitments, neither are the monetary commitments. So that uh, in terms of that, the, um, there's no explicit intent to violate international law. On the other hand, the United States continues to be a party to the agreement, including the legally binding provisions, such as reporting, attendance at the Conference of the Parties, and that sort of thing. Trump also proposed to, if you, you may recall, to uh, renegotiate the agreement. Well, this is not NAFTA, which has only two other parties. This has, there are 190 other parties. France, Germany, and Italy, basically the EU immediately rejected that proposal on the very same day. Um, the, uh, why would they do that? Political will was difficult to muster by 2015. The United States was, at least according to some views, a difficult player in this process. It hadn't become a party to Kyoto. Uh, having, it was a very active, shall we say, participant in the Paris negotiations and then to pull out, um, one might reasonably start to question the, uh, the United States um, bona fides in the, in, the, um, in the negotiations. And then last, what would be renegotiated? The agreement is very, very lightly textured. The obligations are, are, are not demanding and to a large extent just restate those in the 1992 convention that the United States is already delivering on. Trump in his statement did not say exactly what he wants to see that is different from the existing situation. Um, just one last point and then I'll wrap up and we'll have some time for questions. Uh, one other idea that was floating around was the idea of submitting the agreement post hoc after it had en already entered into force to the Senate for its advice and consent. The, as you know from uh, students of the US Constitution, uh, international agreements, treaties enter into force for the United States after the Senate has given its advice and consent by a two thirds majority. Um, the theory here was a different one employed by the Obama administration, employed in about 90% of, of international agreements done by the United States as executive agreements based on the existing legal authority. The theory here is the, exist, the authority already exists. It's either the president's own plenary powers, he can exchange information with other governments, the statute, the Clean Air Act, the supporting the Clean Power Plan, or the existing framework convention to which the Senate gave its advice and consent. So that uh, advice, Senate advice and consent would be redundant. 90% of agreements are done this way. Um, and uh, I've put out an analysis that shows that the tracking is perfect between the obligations in the Paris Agreement and the existing legal authority. That's one reason why the US held up the negotiations at the last minute, to make sure that there was a perfect tracking between these legal authorities and the text. Now, that might not sound very uh, cooperative from the point of view of a multilateral process, but it, it, the idea was to insulate the United States uh, when it brought the agreement home from attacks of exactly this kind. Second of all, to my knowledge, no president has ever submitted an, a, a concluded agreement to the Senate, and there's good reason. The reason is that it tends to erode presidential powers. Presidents have been very, very jealous of their, of their prerogatives, including uh, even mild-mannered man Jimmy Carter, remember, he used to go on the television in a cardigan. Uh, when it came to uh, recognizing the People's Republic of China, and terminating the mutual defense treaty with Taiwan, he was extraordinarily aggressive and insisted on his unilateral authority to do so. That went all the way up to the Supreme Court, which more or less upheld his authority to do so. It was a plurality opinion. So uh, presidents typically do not like to, com to, uh, to cooperate with Congress unless they absolutely have to, particularly in the foreign relations area. Um, last, there is, is there has been a proposal around to speed up the denunciation, same term as withdrawal, to speed up the denunciation of the Paris Agreement 
by withdrawing from the convention, which only has a one-year waiting period. However, uh, this is the convention text now. Any party that withdraws from the convention shall be considered as also having withdrawn from any protocol. Paris is not a protocol. In fact, during the negotiations, the term protocol was explicitly rejected. The, as you recall, there are withdrawal provisions from the Paris Agreement, but this uncertainty about its status as a protocol or not uh, again rears its head as, and I can explain this in greater detail if you want, uh, as uncertainty about the time frame. So it's not clear that withdrawing from the framework convention, which of course would have a much broader effect, um, would necessarily affect um, the, uh, would necessarily speed up the time frame. Um, so in conclusion, first of all, the formal notice hasn't been given. One might speculate as to why. Uh, the U.S. is definitely a party until 2020. Um, the, it is legally obliged to deliver on its legally binding commitments until then, and the opportunity is alive uh, until the next election, easily to reverse the decision should a successful candidate choose to do so. So once again, thank you for the opportunity to present this analysis. As I say, it's, uh, it's, it's basic public international law, um, and, um, uh, but an analysis that, at least in my opinion, has gotten insufficient attention. Thank you very much. In, can you elaborate? <laughs> Is he still the Secretary of State or not? Uh, I mean, he's still the Secretary of State. Uh, Is he going to have any role at all in future negotiations, discussions? Okay, well, um, if you permit me a bit of embellishment. The, the, the State Department is our foreign ministry, right? It's every government has a foreign ministry that communicates with other governments. The State Department was, in fact, the first cabinet-level department to be created um, in, uh, after the Constitution because it's so important that governments be able to communicate with each other. Um, so the Secretary of State has a, a different role and a arguably more important role with respect to the Paris Agreement than any other uh, cabinet level minister, including the administrator of the EPA. Uh, he communicates to foreign governments. He, and there is a uh, legal cadre within the State Department, the Legal Advisors Office, it's called, my former employer, which is responsible for processing these sorts of things. Um, since I come out of that shop, I would be uh, surprised if any State Department lawyer were to deliver an analysis was very different from what I just told you. And a, a responsible lawyer would tell um, her client, the Secretary of State, that there are no benefits to delivering the notice of withdrawal right now. Um, in fact, if you read the actual language, it's, it requires the expira expiration of a three-year period. So there could actually be a legal question if the notice were to be delivered now about its efficacy after the expiration of the three-year period. So a prudent lawyer would very well, could very well advise the secretary that there's no benefit and pot potentially some downsides to delivering the notice right now. That seems to be where we are. As I said, I actually went on the depository's website and saw that there are uh, 50 notifications since June 1st, none of them coming from the United States, some of them ratifications from other countries. So if I can be allowed to embellish the question just slightly, it looks like the forces of rationality that have been put in place in previous eras at the State Department in particular maybe are being heard in ways that are not necessarily that obvious to us among the public. Is that at least a partial yeah, answer to the question? Example. But is, I mean, would there be back channel? Would there be anything going on between our State Department and the, and the Secret Ministries of, of State of the other parties that would try to keep our involvement alive and nurture it to the next point? What, 
What's going to happen for the next three years? Nothing? Well, uh, let me give you an anecdote that, that is on a, on a different subject. When I, was, when I was working at the State Department, it was during a, a time um, during the Reagan administration, which was sued by Nicaragua over the uh, Sandinista situation. The, the president himself decided not to appear in the International Court of Justice uh, for the United States to refrain from appearing. Um, I happened to be in The Hague at the time in my personal capacity and discovered, to my surprise, even though the council table was, was, uh, was entirely empty, that, uh, that a very large contingent of my colleagues had been sent over to The Hague. They were sitting in the, the courthouse in Scavening and sitting there in the evening writing press releases stating what this is well known, uh, stating what they would have said if they actually had been in the courtroom that day. And it's called representing a difficult client, right? Uh, mitigating some of the worst, most adverse effects. So one of the points here is that the system itself involves junctures at which some of the worst adverse effects are likely to be mitigated. And then the exercise of professional judgment in ways that may not be obvious to those, to those of us in the public, such as sitting in the courthouse writing press releases instead of uh, making oral arguments, is, um, uh, may very well be going on as well. One would, in fact, expect that to happen. That would be the norm in most presidencies. So I hope that's responsive. Yeah. What, we have time for one, one more question. Over here, we have a question. First off, thanks, David. You presented very clearly a really complex area. Um, I, and of course, thank you for all your scholarship because I rely on it so that David then can rely on both. <laughs> um, I have a slightly different question, although I do want to say that at the intercessional meeting in May, we saw the U.S. delegation engaging quite a bit and still taking on leadership roles there, which is interesting, um, both in the transparency side of things as well as in the um, uh, loss and damage side, the adaptation aspect. Here's my question, though. There's been a lot of talk in the press about, uh, despite back, um, move, backward movement on, for, at the federal level uh, on the U.S. INDC uh, contributions or pledges, mm -hmm. that the states can make up the difference or at least can do more. And, and so there's a lot of numbers running around that it be curious about your take on that, whether that's potential, what percentage of it, that kind of thing. But also, I know that we talked about this before, when, the national, when our national government made its INDC, it was never clear how much the states contributed right. to that. So I just would love your take on that, both in kind of the trenches of that information, but relating it to the popular opinion that states can make up the difference. Right. Okay, so the question is, what's the relationship between the behavior of subnational, what an international lawyer would call subnational units, the states, municipalities, cities, and the US NDC. Um, well, first of all, the US NDC hasn't been changed, right? And uh, so it, on the other hand, it's not binding. Uh, I probably, I, I can't say that I, I can give you any numbers because I haven't, um, I haven't actually analyzed the question of the extent to which the US NDC could be made up for by non-federal actions. Um, but, um, what we've seen is that subnational units have, have plucked the US NDC out and adopted it as their own. So at, at some level, um, maybe this is what was intended by the negotiators. I mean, the whole agreement is so loosely textured. The NDCs are non-binding. Uh, our own government hasn't even bothered to amend it, let alone with, begin the withdrawal process. So. The basic message is, let's everybody do what we can with the tools that we have here in Vermont, here in South Royalton, cities and, and, and towns, and see where we end up. There, I've seen some reports, and again, I can't verify them because I don't have the, the tools to do that kind of reverse engineering, that suggest we might actually get something towards something close from, to the NDC strictly for market forces um, in terms of substitution of renewables for fossil fuels um, and, and that sort of thing. So um, I, I guess my observation, not terribly insightful, would be not to worry about this too much, except that now it certainly, uh, now it certainly assumes a symbolic value. 
that subnational units can contribute to making up the difference from, uh, from that, that we may not see on the part of the feds. Uh, my personal view is that the, the, the big uncertainty in all of this is the clean power plan. And you may have seen just in the past few days, the DC Circuit held that the attempt to withdraw the methane rule, uh, in fact, cannot be done. It's a, a, we teach this in administrative law about rescission of a rule. And uh, if that is applied to the Clean Power Plan, then I think it's going to be harder for the Trump administration to undo the implementing piece of the US NDC at the domestic level. David, thank you so much. Thanks to all of you.